next level. How's it going? We have a special guest. I know I say it all the time, special guest, special guest. They're all special, but this one is special because uh, I have Corinne Latre. Did I get that right? Yes, good job. Yes. And you know me guys, I screw up everybody's name and I got this one right. Now I've known Corinne for a long time, but not like formally where you call each other by their last names. So I just wanna make this very clear. We're not strangers in any way, but um, Corinne is the wife of one of my dearest and, and like one of my most favorite people in, on the world, in the world. He's been on the podcast, Sergey, uh, and everybody loved it when he came on the podcast. And, and you just started a podcast, Corinne, and I, I've listened to it. I love it. And I thought we got to get together. We got to talk about this topic that we're going to discuss today. You're a, an athlete. You're a performer, all the things that, uh, you know, we, well, we talk about on the Coach Glass podcast. So, uh, but we're going to talk about a special topic today and uh, we'll get into it in a minute, but first and foremost, welcome to the Coach Glass podcast. Thank you so much, Jason. I'm really happy to be here. Now your podcast is Corinne Moments and Correct. it's on iTunes and everywhere else you can find it. And you're also Corinne.moments with an S on Instagram. That's right. With the yeah. S. I love your posts because they make me feel horrible. They make me feel like, cause you're doing all the things on there that I can't do. You, you're dancing and you're doing <laughs> acrobatics and handstands. And, <laughs> and I'm just like, hmm, I wish I could do the, you should see me hit a golf ball. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Okay. So I can make you feel bad in golf and yeah, vice versa. hundred percent. Okay. So um, you just, just, we'll go through a brief history because I really want to get into the topic, but um, you were a Cirque du Soleil acrobat, but that you, you don't just like wake up one day as a kid and go, I want to be a Cirque du Soleil acrobat. That just doesn't happen. So like, how, what is that path? If you don't mind just taking us backwards, how, what is the path to being a Cirque du Soleil performer? Of course. Well, I kind of did wake up one day. Like I, <laughs> I, I was a competitive gymnast growing up. I was the kid that was walking on banisters and my parents were like, okay, we have to do something with her or she's going to, you know, hurt herself or someone else. So they found the nearest gym club. It was nearby and it was just kind of a no brainer. They threw me in there and I, I excelled quite quickly. I was a natural. And at the age of probably seven or eight, I saw Cirque du Soleil on TV and I just remember being completely captivated by what these people were doing. They're wearing these like stretchy, shiny leotards and they're bouncing around on stage and huzzah at the end. And it was just like everything my soul was screaming for. So I said, like, I, that's what I want to do. I want to do that when I grow up. And I, you know, I proceeded to compete in gymnastics and then the time came where I just felt like it was time for me to retire. I wasn't super passionate about the competitive sphere of gymnastics. I loved training. I loved the repetition and the mastery and all the acrobatic elements, but not so much like the whole competitive stuff. So anyways, I ended up getting the opportunity to go to the National Circus School in Montreal, which is a real thing. Which I got a trade. I know uh, I'm from Victoria. I'm from the island, Vancouver Island. Why did I think you were, maybe because you, tr you trained there? Like, yeah, and my name is French. <laughs> so my family, my family is from Quebec. And oh, okay. uh, so I did, like, my grandparents were there and it was great because I was able to reconnect with my extended family. But um, I'm from Vancouver Island originally. And yeah, I ran off and went to circus school, got a- Ran off to the circus. Ran off fully. Like, it was amazing. It was a three-year program. I got, like, my trade diploma in circus arts. It's like the same as plumbing, just handstands. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. None of my plumbers that I've had uh, work on my home can do a handstand. So, uh, yeah. And you probably can't change a faucet. I don't know. Maybe you can. You know what? I can't. <laughs> I can't. So yeah, then um, I was really, you know, the, the clouds parted and I got the opportunity after graduating to audition for Cirque du Soleil and I got in and there we go. So I was part of this new creation. We, um, where I met my husband, Sergey, who you had already on the show. And we, we toured with Cirque for seven years we did this partner acrobatic act so like hand to hand it's like he lifts me and throws me and flips me and catches me and 
Basically, was, he does all the work, is what you first. Saying. Yeah, I was just standing there. <laughs> I'm just a floppy noodle, and he just throws me around making pizza with me. Totally. <laughs> yeah, it was really, it was phenomenal. It was everything I had dreamed of and more. It filled my heart and soul and took me around the world. It was brilliant. Yeah, it, you know, um, that is like the, the, exactly what every athlete wants. Like you, you had a passion, you work your ass off and you do all the training and gymnastics training and acrobatic training. It's, it's not fun. I mean, I mean, it's fun, but it's, it's like painstaking. It's not like standing on a driving range and hitting two buckets of balls a day. It's, it's, you're literally, you know, almost breaking your neck every time you go to do a, a balance beam, you know, back handspring. I mean, it's, it's pretty crazy stuff. Lots of injuries along the way, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, I was, I was pretty lucky. There were definitely, um, some, some pretty good injuries, but most of it would be overuse. You know, we were, we were performing 10 shows a week with one dark day every week. So wow, you know, that's a huge schedule for seven years. Like we, you know, it was a lot, a lot of work. So really it's just things get, um, in sore, mm. but I felt more of the injury and the pain happened after I retired. I think once the body like releases and it's done all that hard work and it knows that there's no show tomorrow or next week, it's like, Oh, okay, I'm done. Well, it's kind of like a, they, you hear about wrestlers. Um, you know, people think when they see wrestling and, and I'm not a fan of wrestling by any means, but I just think it's, it's fascinating that people don't realize that they're doing a show every day. Like they're just constantly traveling and doing a show and you might see them on TV once a week, but they're actually, somewhere every night doing yeah. a show and it wears on you. I mean, you're, totally. you're basically playing, a, you know, for them, it's like being in a football game every day for mm -hmm. you. It's similar. The, the stress and strain. Well, I mean, I, I could take a yoga class and I need three days off afterwards. So it, I can't imagine doing back handsprings while, you know, your husband's throwing you up in the air. Uh, that's yeah. You're, you're going to be sore. Yeah. But you're so in tune. And like you've, I, you know, when you've been doing it since the age of five, it's your body knows what to expect. And, you know, we were prepared, we, we were conditioned and, um, you're kind of like, you're either made for it or you're not. There was right. those, those, some people that were just injured all the time and they barely ever were in the show. And then the other people that honestly were very rarely injured. And it, part of it is just genetics. Part of it is how well you take care of yourself, how much you're drinking on weekend on that one day off, like <laughs> one day. <laughs> It was the circus. So, you yeah, know, exactly. it was, yeah. Well, you know, th that's the whole point of, of the conversation that we want to have today is that um, we just kind of very briefly, and we could spend an hour talking about the training that went into it, but you really dedicated your entire life up to that point on preparing your body to do unbelievable things that defy gravity, um, do it on a nightly basis and be, you know, resilient, be able to handle the loads, be able to be creative in all, all the aspects that make the art what it is. But at some point, all that comes to an end. And that's what today's topic is about. Um, you know, I, I think that if I was to say to people, uh, we're going to talk about a really relatable subject, we're going to talk about what it feels like to retire from the circus. You, you know how everybody retires from the circus and people would be like, uh, Jay, I, that, no, nobody retires. I mean, no, uh, but when we go into it, what you're going to realize is a lot of things that we touch on the psycho emotional, uh, all the, all the, uh, the other aspects of it, the soft aspects of it, the, the questioning of yourself and who are you and, and the, the self-realization, all these things that go into that transition, mm -hmm. you are going to recognize because, Hey, I'll tell you what, if there's been one thing that I've learned over the last 14 months, it's been really self-analysis about who I was and get a little break from it and decide really who I want to be moving mm -hmm. forward. So this is a perfect time for this conversation. Um, maybe share a little bit about uh, at what point you decided like this is, uh, this is the time. Like how do you, especially when you're a couple, a team, how do you both come to the conclusion at the same time that it's time to hang up your, uh, I don't know what it is in circus. Uh, what do you hang up? Leotard? <laughs> your leotard? You hang up your leotard. How do you guys- I didn't wear shoes, so. 
how do you how do you hang up your leotard? I mean, like when when do you have that decision and and how long was that process for the two of you to come to that point where you could say that? Yeah, well, luckily, my husband and I are both very pragmatic and we're forward thinkers in the sense that we're kind of looking at like, where is this headed and what are my goals? And we've been really we've talked about that since the beginning of our relationship. It also helps that we were teammates. So we we really had to be super connected in order to really like put my life, especially in his hands every day. Um, and what happened, I think, is that we, I was at the point where I was just about to turn 30 and we'd been on the road for about seven years and it, it had been great. And we had kind of done everything we'd set out to do within the show. Like we both came into the show as group act performers. They're called, it's called the house troupe. It would be like mm -hmm. the core if you're on Broadway or something like that or in dance. And we then got the opportunity to build up a solo act, create a solo act while on the road on tour. It was incredibly challenging to create a brand new act while also doing 10 shows a week. But um, we did that and then we got that act was featured in the show. So we were performing up to like seven, eight, nine, ten 10 shows a week, our own act, plus the group stuff. Like we were just super implicated into the show. And I, I had a management role. I was, I was like the, the trainer for the contortionist as well as the dance captain on the troupe. So like wow. we had really checked a lot of boxes and we just felt like, okay, we can't grow anymore with this show. And, you know, as much as I love being comfortable and it was really nice once we got to the point of the show was like so well oiled that you almost like go out every day in this kind of hypnotic flow state where you just, you know, like if ever you, I don't know, I'm sure you can relate it to what you've done. You play a round of golf and you do something and you're just so in the zone that you barely even notice time going by. Yeah. I, I don't feel that I'm just so just, let's be very clear. I'm not a very good golfer, and, Okay, and, well, yeah, but, but I feel that similarly when I do stand up comedy, uh, it more so because the, the act that you've curated over a period of time, it, it's different every time you go on stage because the audience responds differently, but the, the beats and the elements of it are, are similar. Mm -hmm. And so every time you step on stage, you kind of get this feeling of like, whoo, comfort, Mm -hmm. uh, adrenaline and also kind of like, what's it, what's going to, am I going to bomb tonight? Am I going to have a good night? Whatever. Um, yeah. So similarly, I, I, I get where you're coming from. You do enter this kind of weird space. And when you come off stage, you kind of go like, what was that? Like it, it's, I don't have a full memory. I could watch it back on yes. video and I'll go, I don't have a full memory of being, I was a hundred percent present, but at the same time, don't remember really like anything kind of out of body almost yeah yeah and yeah. i and, and i that's why i do that like when i lecture uh i i lost that feeling like i could lecture and just go like it was almost like a job but mm -hmm. it was it didn't give me that feeling that you just said so the fact that you could do that for seven years that's why i went into stand-up was i needed that feeling of like this is special the butterflies the adrenaline the uh afterwards this big feeling of whoo like we did it you know um, mm -hmm. so yeah, that, to do that for seven years, that's a adrenaline dump, man. Oh man. It took a lot of energy, like from within. And, you know, that was really where we both started to feel like that feeling was starting to, to go away a little bit. Like it wasn't like, we still loved it and going out on stage, performing in front of 3000 people, what a privilege and what a rush every day. But when it gets to be so predictable that you're like, they could throw anything at me. We've done all the tracks. We've filled in for everybody. We, it just, we were like, okay, well, what's next? So we put in applications to get onto a permanent show sort of scenario in Vegas because, you know, we were thinking about wanting to start a family and we just didn't really want to do it on the road. Some people do, but it just wasn't really what we were into. And uh, after waiting a couple of years to see if something would open up, nothing did because no one leaves those shows. Right. People in Vegas, that's like a retirement gig. They perform on a, like, they don't have such a grueling schedule. They also have like sort of a normal work-life balance. They can have kids, take their kids to school every day, pick their kids up from school wow. and go perform at like 6 PM. Huh. So it's a different, it's a different gig and it would have, it sounded really appealing, but it just like the opportunity never came. And so we're like, okay, 
we, it's time because we, we realized that starting over was going to be really hard at any point, but it would be maybe be marginally easier as younger people versus as 45 year olds with a blown out knee <laughs> and little to no additional skills right. because you're so like, we're so in a bubble there on tour, right? Like we're really great at what we do, but we're not like applying for jobs. We don't have a resume. We don't have, like, we have lots of very great skills, but it's hard to figure out how all those skills are going to apply in the real world. Cause like, yeah, look, you, like lift translate? my leg up. Like, <laughs> yeah. Pay me. <laughs> Pay me. <laughs> but that, I mean... That's kind of, to be fair, that's when, uh, when Sergey came to my mentorship. Um, that's where we were at. He had these incredible skills that to be honest, he, he really didn't value quite as well as, as I thought he should have. Mm -hmm. And so he was talking about doing all these, like, here's my goals. I want to do X, Y, and Z. And, and everyone in the room was just kind of like, oh, you have so much more to offer the world than that. I mean, oh, really? Okay. That's what you want to do? I, I think with your background, if you're not pulling from those years of being an artist, if you're not pulling from that to turn that into something that you, you know, really you want to do for the rest of your life, a passion, mm -hmm. You can't, you can't leave that behind. We got to in, ingrain it. And once we did that, we saw this light bulb switch in him. Not that, not that the mentorship decided what he was going to do in his life. I'm just saying that we saw a switch where he said, I thought that the, the world, this is the way you get on with life. Like this is when you get a job, this is what you do. And this is the kind of work that I would be appropriate for. Mm -hmm. But when we allowed him to say like, oh, you can dream about this. You can actually you can take all the things you learned as an acrobat and you, you should have an acrobatic school. You should have like, you, sh you don't lose this. You got to keep, keep going. Um, it was amazing. And I still have the tape. And obviously this isn't about your husband, but, but I got to see during that transition period um, the, the thought process that was going through. And I still have the tape today of him uh, projecting forward five years in the mentorship and saying, this is who I'm going to be in five years. And, and play that role as that person, there was not a dry eye in the house. Everybody was losing their shit because he's such a passionate person. And, and you can feel that the true sense of Sergey came out. Yeah. Um, and and in, in a sense, you had to go through a similar process. How did you do that? Yeah, you know, I was, I I thought that when I retired, I, it had to be all or nothing that I, now I was done with that life. I'm going to move into this life. And, uh, it took me forever to, like, I decided I wanted to be a wedding planner. <laughs> was it because, was, because of a movie or <laughs> maybe yeah. I wanted to be JLo from yeah. whatever that <laughs> who doesn't. Right? Yeah. I don't think she got there by being a wedding planner, but no. whatever. Uh, so I don't know. No, it's because we had like just gotten married and that was my only like out of surface experience, I guess, in years and years and years. And so I went in to plan, started planning weddings, got a job at a hotel locally in Vancouver and was there for five months working the graveyard shift. And oh. I wanted to die. Like it was it was so far, it was like the furthest away from myself I could possibly be. It, oh, I can't, it's like, and while that is a great job for many people and they, I'm sure they're good at it and they love it. It was, I was terrible at it and I love customer service. I love people, but no. So anyways, after several months of that, Sergey's like, okay, are you, are you done now? Are you ready to start training clients and like getting back into fitness and the yeah, getting into world. fitness coaching and, and training. Yeah. 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 Cause at this point, Sergey already had like really the ball rolling on or our, our, his personal training business. Yeah. Was like, Corinne, yeah. Fitnastica. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So he's like, Corinne, why don't you like come aboard? I was, he was like, he let me get it out of my system. You know, he, he wanted me to get there in my own time. He's good like that. So I did, but I started training clients and then, you know, really shortly after I got pregnant with our first kid and had a baby. And then very shortly after that had another baby. And it was like, I never really got a chance to immerse myself fully into our personal training business because I was busy, like trying to build an identity as a trainer and trying to become a mom and trying to like, 
build roots here in Vancouver where we, we don't, didn't know any, anybody here, you know, when you come off tour off the road, you're not, we didn't have, we just really started from scratch. And I really struggled. I really struggled for a long time. Like I was going through all the motions and I was successful, you know, like in the sense that I had a nice full client roster. I was really blessed to be able to help people feel better in their bodies and build up healthier lifestyles and all that was working. But for some reason, my like heart wasn't, I just wasn't feeling full or fulfilled the way I was when I was performing. And I'm thinking to myself, am I ever, ever going to feel that way again? It, it's been, it's been, it's been a track. Yeah. And, and that, that's really what, you know, we've now laid out the kind of the groundwork, I think for, for the conversation, because um, I think what everybody's going through right now um, over the last 14 months has is, is been that where for a lot of people, uh, trainers and coaches, maybe they've had to shut down their gym for a short period of time uh, or throughout the entire time, um, or they've had clients that are, don't feel comfortable coming into their gyms. Um, there's been sports leagues that have you know fallen off and then they went to bubbles and um, every, every element of coaching in, in high performance coaching to personal training and everything in between has been affected by this. And me personally, I went from um, being on the road uh, six to eight days a month, uh, traveling, uh, lecturing, teaching courses, and, and uh, really just kind of like living the jet set life, going mm -hmm. to tour events and working with professional athletes. So I went from this guy who part of my identity was walking into an airport and having a concierge meet me and say, Jason, here's your ticket for today. Mm -hmm. uh, and then take into the lounge and then sit up front in the plane, arrive. Marriott would say, we've got you a nice suite at the top of the, you know, like, like I was being, I had made it in, in that world. And it's because it's sad, but it's because I traveled that much that you started having um, kind of uh, uh, treated a certain way. And you, and I hate to say it cause I'm not that person, but I, I kind of got used to that lifestyle. And all of a sudden it was like, poof, it stopped. Instantly, I wasn't able to see my clients. So I thought I'm gonna lose all my players because I can't get to them. So, and then my gym shut down. And then, so now I was like, well, okay. So I'm not a, I'm not a trainer. I'm not a PGA tour coach. Uh, I don't lecture. I can't travel. I, and I can't do my stand up. I can't, like, I can't do anything. So everything that made me my identity of who I was instantly was gone. And I, I'm not special. It happened to everybody. I'm, that, yeah. This is just my story. Absolutely. Right. So when that happened, I actually took the time. I was doing a lot of reading on Buddhism, a lot of stoic reading um, and a lot of that kind of stuff of like kind of philosophy of life. And, and what I really came up with was let's, let's play this experiment. And, and I want to play this experiment with you. I think it'll be a good way to lead into this. Uh, let's have the experiment of remove all of those things. And actually it was really happening, but let's, let's say you're no longer a trainer. You're no longer traveling. You don't lecture. You're not a comic. You don't do any of the things that you love to do. Take that away. Now, who are you? Yeah. What are you left with? And when I did that, it made it very, very clear. Like it really smacked me in the face. There's one thing that I want to do, right? There's like, there's like a, like an inner need to coach and mentor. There's mm -hmm. an inner need to help people and give service to people. And so I was like, well, then moving forward, if whatever opportunities come my way, don't meet those needs, then I'm not doing it. So it, it actually simplified my life. I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. And that's what same with me. Like I I'm telling you, we retired nine years ago and while I've been happy, like I have a, a really beautiful business and I've had so many, I've tried, I've taken on lots of different opportunities. I've been like, okay, no, that doesn't work for me. No, I'm not that, but I've tried things. I'm, I'm really not fearful of trying new things, but it's taken me up until this year where we got like face to face with ourselves mm -hmm. to be like, okay, wait, who am I? And what's important to me? Because I, I realized I did like a coaching, a chakra alignment session, cool. which was brand new for me. I've never done anything like it. And I 
we were talking she's brilliant. And I realized that everything I've done has always been for external gratification, especially mm -hmm. as a performer or an entertainer, right? It's like, I go up there, ta-da, and people are like, oh, bravo. And you're like, yes, okay, moving along. And- You thought that was good. Wait till you see this one. <laughs> <laughs> totally. And as much as it's like so much about the ego, right? Even though we don't think of it that way, we're, we're just like, let me demonstrate to you my level of mastery. Yes and maybe inspire you or make you cry or laugh or yep. yay. And then, you know, but it's just your job. You're not doing it from a place of like, I have a huge ego. It's, I was getting paid to do that. But, but the ego is being fed for sure. Oh, huge. Yeah, yeah it's hungry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then you get into the real world or the real, the real world, whatever you want to call it. Like this other side on the other side of the curtain. And I'm like, okay, no one's clapping. That's fine. Cause I, <laughs> I would be really weird, but, and, but who am I and what's my worth without all of that? What's my, yeah. like, what? So it's been a huge, a huge shift. So I, same thing kind of came to the like realization that I love to serve and coach and I love to entertain and that's yeah. not going to change. I took the entertainment part of myself out when I retired thinking that I couldn't entertain if I wasn't like, an entertainer or being paid to entertain or, you know, and I'm realizing now that maybe I can blend that into what I do. Did you make the mistake I did when, when I first started as a trainer, I thought I was an entertainer. So when a client would come to see me, I'd be like, Hey, how's it going? And I'd like, you know, and I would try and like joke and I would maybe do some silly dance that would catch them off guard. I'm like, I had no idea. This was when I first got out of college. I, I like, and my the the boss that I had at the time. He goes, AJ, you need to you need to slow down, okay? Because you you can't keep this up. If they expect you to be like performing yeah. every show, like or sorry, see, I call it a show every yeah, time no, they come I in for it. a session, then you you can't keep this up. And I was like, ah, I think I can, um, but I didn't realize it. <laughs> like, at some point, you have to flip the script and go, what is the experience of the client? It's it's about them. It's not about you. Totally. So why are you, why are you trying to put on a show for these people? So, but the entertainer in you, this is the beautiful thing. You had an audience of one when you're, when you're personal training, when you have a small group class, you've got an audience of four, six, whatever it happens to be, but it's not, you're not entertaining. No, you're, you're coaching. Yeah. So the podcast coming out with Corinne moments that allowed you to really express your personality in a way. Um, is, is that, has that outlet being able to, to speak into the microphone and really put your, you, uh, you put your heart and soul into that. I mean, your emotions are raw and they're right out there. Um, when you did that, did that give you a little sense of like, you're yeah. out there, you're on iTunes. I mean, it's like all this fun stuff. Yeah, it is. It is definitely doing that. I feel like I have this outlet. It's also very cathartic because I'm, I'm just trying to be really honest with people and share my journey or be um, a platform for other people to share their own journey. And it has, it is, it is serving me. Yeah, for sure. Which again, I'm like, oh gosh, is this the right call? Am I just feeding my ego again? Yeah. <laughs> and that's okay. It, you know what? Uh, I have a, a friend of mine who worked, he's a caddy on tour. And I, I had uh, talked to him about, we were, we were talking about uh, service and, and whether or not something is um, uh, selfish or selfless. And I said, well, as he was talking about being selfless, being a caddy is being very selfless. Like you're, you're basically carrying someone's bag for them, you know, yeah. and he's of service to somebody. So we were talking about that. And he said, I, he goes, he was talking about why you have to live a life of selflessness. And I said, actually, I, in some ways, now that you've described it, I feel very selfish. And he goes, why is that? And I said, well, my podcast is all about me. Um, my Instagram, like I do selfies, you know, trying to sell my products that are, are yeah. me, all these things are like, it's all selfish. And he goes, Oh no, you're actually one of the most selfless people I know. And I said, well, all these things that I just described are selfish. They're, they're mm -hmm. feeding that part of me about me, me, me. And he goes, but what's the intent behind it? Yeah. What's is the intent to, make people like applaud for you or are you actually trying to help people? And I go, well, I'm trying to help people. And he goes, well, then it's selfless. You just have to do it in a way that comes across that. So your podcast, it, 
you are so honest in it and you just, you just pour your heart out, especially the, the episode three, where you, you know, you had a self recording of yourself, just sharing your thoughts and uh, it's very emotional. Um, it's real thoughts and real feelings and, uh, um, but you're not doing it. So people go, Oh, Corinne, no, like please. You're, it, I, you're just being honest. Yeah. So I don't it, want a pity party. No, the intent is you have the correct intent, which makes it selflessness. So. Well, thank you. I, yeah. yes. And I, I do like when somebody messages me or, and tells me, gosh, that spoke to me. And I went through a similar experience. I'm just like, yes. First of all, it's amazing to know that I'm not alone and I'm not an anomaly, but also to know that if that they're like, I couldn't talk about it because I felt so embarrassed. Like I, mm. I went, I was going through this dark time for so many years and I didn't, I, I didn't even acknowledge it myself because as an athlete, you're, you're taught to, you know, be tough and to, you know, you just overcome obstacles. And I had very much made the choice to retire from the circus. Like I, no one forced me. My body didn't explode. I really chose the timing and it was all scheduled and everything went sort of according to plan. The only part that didn't go to according to plan was like how my heart felt. Right. And I couldn't have prepared for that. And as a, somebody that's like really emotional and very, very passion driven, I was like, I'm, I, I don't have any passion anymore. Like where, what is going to feed and fuel that passion? Cause it's just like sitting and it's like, I could, it was like a flower inside of myself that just started to wither and die. And I felt like there was this big hollow space and I've been like looking and looking for what's going to fill that space for so long. I think, you know, you get off this, I think for anybody, like I've talked to some NCAA athletes, you know, they go through their four years as athletes in college and then uh, their, uh, what's the word for their eligibility ends yeah. and they're done. And they, you yeah. know, their whole four years plus all their young years grow leading into that has all been about the team and the investment in that sport. And as much as like, yeah, I'm studying to be a lawyer, that isn't really a part of your life yet. You no, know, the, yeah. the athletics has been the part of your life and you're left with like this huge void and it doesn't get talked about enough. And I think that actually we should be preparing people for this more than just reacting to what happens afterwards. Well, yeah, you, you see that, like I played college football. Um, I didn't have that moment where I was like, you know, when I left, like, oh, I didn't, it wasn't my thing. Right. I was really good at it, but it wasn't my thing because I didn't leave there with this hole in me. Mm -hmm. But um, when you watch the final four and you see college basketball and you see these seniors, they're graduating. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if they lose this game, that's the last game they're ever going to play. Mm -hmm. And they probably live in Iowa or something like that in a small town. And they're going to be that guy who, hey, man, he was good, but he never made it type thing. And, and he'll work at a car dealership. Who knows? Mm -hmm. I'm just I'm just saying like, it's sad that you see their, their tears and you see them realize like, this is it for me. This is the highlight of my life and it's over. Mm -hmm. Now, most people retire when they're 65, maybe 60, maybe 55. And they retire from their career. But for many of them, the career was not their passion. It was a job. So for you to be able to retire in your early thirties, like, who does that? Now, and now you have to recreate your life. Uh, my wife always says to me, like, well, well, when are you going to retire? Like, because we're, I'm 48. So we look at like, well, do I have 12 years left to work? Or mm -hmm. do I have seven, you know, who knows, 15 years? I don't know. But I'm like, I'm not retire. Why would I, why would I retire? What am I retiring from? Yeah. Like, I love what I do. But if, mm -hmm. if I was forced to, which is what happened to you. I mean, you just can't be in circus till you're 65. So um, recreating your world at, at 30 years old. Yes, you got distracted by having kids. And I don't mean as a distraction, but no, you, you didn't have to deal with just, you didn't have to deal with it at that point. Cause you're like, well, I'm a mom. Mm -hmm. What happens after that is what you're going through right now. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And I just, you know, I believe that everybody need, has and needs to have a purpose and whether mm -hmm. that comes through in your career or comes through because you love to knit socks and that's your, it fills your cup. I like do. it doesn't have to be like you're saving or solving world hunger, although that would be great <laughs> if that's your purpose. But 
for me, my purpose was performing and moving my body and like, like really projecting that's entertaining was my purpose. And then that was taken away, but I don't, I, well, it wasn't taken away. I, I don't want to say that. I want to retract that statement. I chose to move on from that, but I believe that like, for example, you talked about retirement, like at, at old age, my grandfather worked his whole life as a blue collar worker and very pragmatic. Of course, this was a different generation ago, but him and his wife planned and saved and bought their little cottage where they lived out their retirement. So after he retired from working, he put his whole heart and soul into that property and living out his retirement. And then I don't know, it was maybe like, say, five or six years ago in his early 80s, it just was we could see that they they couldn't maintain that property anymore and he was really into having a little wood shop and always repairing and always fixing and everything every year you'd go visit and there'd be something new or different there and they moved into assisted living and nobody had a major health decline it was just that we are planning for the future and you're not going to be able to keep this up much longer and he brought his toolbox with him to assisted living. <laughs> he put it in the closet because he's going to need it for. You never know. Yeah. And within about a year, his health took such a massive decline. Wow. Because he, he basically, he got to that apartment and he sat down and he basically hardly like he just didn't get back up again. You know, mm. like there was no longer anything to do. Right. And he was still sharp and he was still physically capable, but you know, there's only so much Sudoku you can do. And he, he started to decline and his morale started to go down. And it's just been like an, a steady decline since then. We could call it a coincidence. We could call it old age, but I think yeah. a lot of it has to do with the loss of purpose. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, you know, when you look at it, you can, some people find purpose in being a, grandparent for for instance they might go you know like they put their entire so they put their life into themselves and then they get married and have kids then they put their their whole life into their children mm -hmm. then their children grow up and you see a lot of couples at this point where as soon as the kids move out they're kind of look at each other like who who the hell are you and now it's like oh we have to now have a new relationship and for mm -hmm. a lot of them they realize at that point ah, that's pretty much what our relationship was but some of them stay together. So then they stay together and then their kids have kids. So now they put all their energy. So they're, they're over every weekend. They're dropping in, popping by, just made these cookies. Uh, can I take the kids to school tomorrow? They start being involved in their lives. Mm -hmm. um, so that gives them more purpose. And you see those grandparents are very healthy. They're mentally acute. They're yeah. involved with something. The ones that retract and don't have anything, those are the ones you start to see like, have you talked to uh, Auntie Marjorie? It's like, <laughs> no, no one in the family's talked to her. Then you finally go over and you're like, whoa, right? So there has to be human connection. There has to be purpose. There has to be something that you can engage in. Wake up in the morning and go, I have to. Sudoku is not an option. <laughs> Yeah, like it's not enough. And no. that's why like what's great about North America, or at least where we live in BC, they, there's so many great programs in place for aging people. You know, you can join the, the croquet team or you can, you know, there's lots of different things for retired people. Um, Sergey, my croquet husband. croquet team? The, oh yeah, like I know, yeah, there's people who like play croquet. croquet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but like in same where my husband's from, like he's from Kazakhstan and his dad retired from, he, you know, he's, his dad is quite artistic. His career was very much his, his thing. And when he retired, same thing, but he was much younger than my grandpa and he sat down for a year and basically didn't get back up again. And next thing, you know, he's got like heart problems and all this stuff that didn't exist when he was working because he just like, we are made to be doing something and we're made to be pursuing something. I believe that it not only keeps like our body healthy, but it's like also about feeding our soul. Absolutely. You know, let's, let's go, um, you know, obviously there, there are, um, maybe there's people listening to this that are, you know, really going to transition into retirement, but I think there's probably more people here that are <laughs> having to change professions yeah. um, or have had this light bulb moment over COVID where they've just said, you know what, life is uh, impermanent. And maybe it's time for me to do what I want to do and really, you know, take, take life 
by the horns. So what are some of the tips that you might uh, give somebody who's going through those, that thought process? I mean, my entire mentorship is that it's like, if somebody's going to open a new facility, uh, op- start a new brand, um, change, change kind of like a service that they're offering, um, really dream about what they want their career to be. Well, we walk them through a process. What are some of the things that you gained through going through this process that enhanced your ability to transition that might help somebody else? Yeah, I think for me, one of the big things was knowing that I had made the choice made me feel like I didn't have the right to acknowledge how I was truly feeling about my choice. Yeah. Like you you decided that. So it's your fault. Totally. (laughs) Yeah. And like, I don't regret my decision, but yeah, like exactly. I'm thinking to myself, Corinne, you chose this. This is like, you made the bed lay in it kind of thing. And which I was like very much doing, but not, I just didn't feel like I was making any progress from like within And so the biggest thing, the first thing that helped me was just a acknowledging, okay, you know what? I feel whatever I'm feeling, which is hollow, empty, um, unfulfilled or misunderstood, you know, because having come from where I came from in, in my job coming here, feeling like not very many people could relate to me or I could relate to them. So the biggest thing was acknowledging it and then talking about it, like talking about it with my husband or my, your partner or, and then talking to people who maybe if you were part of a team, um, asking them, you know, I've been feeling this way. How, how are you feeling? Are you going through this? Am I alone? Like even with everything that's been going on with the pandemic, people have lost their careers or they've, their career has been put on hold and everyone's like fighting alone especially because we've been so separated with the the need for isolation and i think the biggest thing is to find that you are not alone and to be able to acknowledge that you're feeling this way it's not weak like you're not you're not weak you're just it just is and then okay yeah i feel like you um um you need to connect with somebody Right. And, and for a lot of people, it's uh, if you have a loved one, that's great. Um, But for a lot of men, a lot of men are kind of like, we're supposed to be strong and stoic and uh, Mm -hmm. nothing affects me. So the fact that I've lost my career basically, and I'm no longer able to provide for my family the way that I was in the past, because my gym shut down, I'm not working anymore. These feelings, a lot of the people feel like they just have to wear that on their chest. But what I found was that's not strength. What strength for me is when I go to bed at night and my wife's like, okay, do you want to talk? And I'm like, no, I'm good. I'm good. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. And she's like, no, I think you need to chat chat because you've been walking around the house with this look on your face for the last few days and what's going on. And as soon as I actually am honest, like, honey, I'm afraid. I'm afraid that uh, I might not ever do this again. I'm afraid that my gym might not open. I'm afraid that I might lose all of this and, and that I might have to recreate myself. I'm afraid that, and I start being honest and vulnerable. And guess what? She's like, oh, so that's what you're going through? Well, let's, and as we talk it out and she, oh, she's just like you, you have a great um, spouse. She's able to give me a little bit of insight. You've done this before. You're, you've been great at everything you've done. You know, you, you've always, you look at all the transitions that you've made up to this point in your career. Look how you, you, that worked out for you when you took on that challenge, you, you know what I mean? And so all of a sudden I'm like, oh yeah, I think I got this a little bit of support, but some people don't have a spouse. So they, you might need a therapist. You might need um, friends, colleagues, but you need to connect with somebody. You need somebody to, to be vulnerable with that you can trust. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. And I, I think that everyone's situation is different, but I don't think, I, I don't think anyone can truly say that they're alone. There's always someone there that's willing to be an ear and just being able to offload can really take a lot of weight off of that. Like that you don't even need to necessarily have to have advice or positive reinforcement, basically yeah. just like being able to say it is like, okay, now you're saying it to yourself or even worst case, like nobody in your circle, you look at yourself in the mirror and you say, Hey, Corinne, I'm feeling like this today. I'm feeling like this today. This is what's going on. And, and just sit in it and be there 
And that's the first step I think to healing. And for me, then the next thing that I really did was I, I needed to stop searching. I spent a really long time searching for like, what am I going to do next? Like, where am I going? Right uh, now. Like right now. right now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And having had kind of a very well-established career and something that was successful, it's like, I wanted to move that success to another level of success like in a straight line where it's really, you kind of have to start from the bottom again. Sorry. It's, it's like, you're not never at the bottom because you have all of this experience in your bag, but you, you still had to be okay with like being a rookie and like say starting a podcast and not knowing what the heck I'm doing. Like I know how to speak. That's a start, but you know, you just have to be okay being uncomfortable and being vulnerable and, and just, yeah, I don't you know. know. What's, you know, what's tough is um, for me, I, I'm a high, high performer, always high expectations of myself, um, always pushing, 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 pushing. So um, what my wife said to me, what, which was really deep was she was just like, um, like, this is not the time to do that because there's nothing to push for. So you can't, you can't force something like the entire world is shut down, Jay. So it's okay for you to take some time off. And if you're trying to push on something that, that isn't responding, it's because the timing isn't right. Well, then you're just, you're going to be frustrated. How about you accept the fact that this is a, a unique time, give yourself a little bit of a break and just be right. And, and so giving me the, allowing me to actually not have to be like, you know, pushing the limits of, I got to be number one, just be. And Mm -hmm. the thing that scared me was I felt, and maybe you've, you, you've gone through this too. I felt like, well, if I stop, I don't know if I could bring it back. So I was like, I have to keep pushing. But what I have over the last 14 months has really allowed myself to kind of just be like, it's okay to read a book in an afternoon or, or just watch a silly TV show I didn't always have to be in the office working. And I found myself, I'd come to the office, I'd sit down at the computer and four hours later, I'd be like, I haven't done anything. And she'd be like, did you, were you working up there? And I'm like, not really. I don't know. I just felt like I had, it's just what I did. Yeah. I didn't know what to do with myself. Like you were still going through the motions. Oh yeah. No intention behind it. Nothing was getting done. It was no intention. And it was just like, I'd create a checklist just so I could check things off. But if you really looked at what was on it, it was like, uh, check your emails. <laughs> I did it. Um, you know, it was such stupid medial things, but I, for some reason I needed that. And, and yeah. that was that realization that asking yourself the question, why do you need that? So take it away. What are you without it? So that would be my advice in, in, in this scenario is play the game right now, folks, play the game at home. Take everything that it identifies you as who you are, uh, your career and everything that makes up all those things that feed your ego. Take those things away just in your mind. Make them like that. You can't do that anymore. Like you blockbuster, you can't rent DVDs anymore. Like you're gonna have to reinvent yourself. So then what are you left with? Yeah. And find out what you're left with and then start from there. And if you start from that, that pureness, like for you, you had to entertain. If you're not entertaining, you're not being Corinne. So um, you, I, I highly recommend you play that role. Remove everything and see what's left. Yeah, the huge thing that's been really transformational for me that I can't believe I, I didn't really notice before that I wasn't doing it was I, I really have been practicing being present. Yep. As, a, as an athlete, and especially as uh, somebody who was on tour, we would really live city to city. So like we had an eight week run, we would like really focus on like counting the weeks and the days and the show numbers, and then moving on like fresh start new city for years and years and years. And as an athlete, same thing, you're always working on these like goals and like measurable results and periodization and doing mm-hmm. this training to lead to this competition or this meet or achieving this skill or whatever it is. And then I've had to like retract all of that, like you're saying, and, and this year has been the best opportunity to learn to be present. So now I'm trying to really 
when I'm with my kids, I'm like a hundred percent with them and enjoying the moment and enjoying the silliness and whatever it is that we're doing. You're not thinking about like, Oh, I have to like email that guy or I have to do this or da 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 bringing it back to the now the today yeah. not the where are we going to be in five years or when COVID is over or when life goes back to normal and all these kind of um they're just it's not real like the real is the now and we're living today and we should be enjoying the moment as it is right now, even if it may be uncomfortable and may be challenging and may not be exactly where we had envisioned it being today. But well, you, you saw that the people that have struggled the most, in my experience, uh, over this time period are the ones that reminisced about the way it used to be. And then we're constantly when is this going to end? They were yeah. fearful of what's going to happen next? When is it going to end, which is future? And then they were reminiscing about what it used to be like in the past. And I, I said to people like, you know, I, me personally, I, I honestly have to believe that what we're currently in is the way it's going to be for the rest of my life Yeah. because I have to live in this right now. So I'm present and this is how it's going to be. And then they go, well, are you trying to say that you, you're never going to travel again? You're never going to lecture again. You're never going to do live shows again. I'm like, I have to mentally prepare myself for that. And if it does open up, it's a bonus, but I can't sit there and like pine over the thought of it. When is it going to happen? Because then I'm not living in the moment. Yeah. Yeah. And you're always, I'm creating resistance. Like you're resisting the present moment because you're waiting for things to go back to normal, whatever that is in, in our imagination. But yeah, exactly. Like living today with what we have and it may or may not be ideal or may not be what it was two years ago, but I think we, we do have the opportunity to make the, the most of it. And yeah, I think for me, that's been the biggest thing is being present and I'm still working at it. It's not easy. Holy cannoli. Well, that, that's the whole point. Like, you know, with all the, uh, the readings I've done in, in, in Buddhist teachings and stuff, you never actually meet it. You never, you never get there. We, in North America, we feel like we have to, uh, there's an end point, uh, like a finish line. And there is yes. no finish line to being present. Like once you start thinking of a finish line, you're no longer in the present. So I mean, it, it, at some point you just have to be, um, and you're going to be reminded of that time and time again. And, and I'm trying to give myself the skills right now so that if, and when it does change and it goes back to a crazy life that I don't lose some of those amazing uh, lessons that I've learned over the last 14 months. Um, I, I got to keep maintain that. I got to maintain walking in the woods, not because you're got a fitness goal and you're trying to break a record just because mm -hmm. um, just be like, take time in the day to just be, you don't have to be working all day long. Um, just be, yeah, be present. Enjoy the rain. If it's raining in like, you can't stop the rain. Go out and go, isn't rain cool? And when it's sunny, be like thankful that it's sunny and enjoy the sun. You know, like so just be, yeah, being in the present and, and enjoying those moments. I can't give that up once the mayhem starts again. I, I can't. If I do, uh, I've kind of given myself a little bit of a, um, a uh, contract of, of sorts that won't allow you. me to do that again. Yeah, you have to, because I, I have to be able to like literally read something written today to my future self saying, hey, don't be that idiot you were before yeah. um, that thought this stuff was so important because it wasn't, you know. I totally agree. Yeah, and I'm, I'm doing the same thing. Like I, I've learned some huge lessons this year or over the course of the past like nine years, but, and I'm, I'm really... I'm really, it's like, I'm getting to know myself again. I didn't know who I was because I had never sat down with her and just like gotten to know her without mm. all of that extra stuff. And so we're getting to know each other again, me, myself, and I, <laughs> it's, it's a process, but I, I think it's such an, also such a great opportunity. Yeah. I, I mean, that, that's exactly what your podcast is. And I highly recommend that people go and check out Corinne moments uh, on iTunes and everywhere you find podcasts. And uh, it sounds like uh, you might have an upcoming guest coming on that, uh, you know, might have some insight on this topic. Um, so um, I look forward to being on your show in the future. Yeah. 
And uh, thank you. Yeah. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about different topics and all that. So everybody that's listening to today's podcast, don't worry, you're not going to get the same podcast just in a different format. Uh, we'll, we'll be talking about new topics and all that kind of fun stuff. Um, and it's always interesting when, uh, when, when you're a podcaster and you interview people and you go on other people's podcasts, it's really hard not to try and interview the person that's interviewing you. Um, Interesting. It's really weird. Um, I'll so, be prepared for that. <laughs> I actually had somebody, it was really cool. Uh, uh, another podcaster uh, said to me, I want to come on your podcast and interview you because you're always interviewing other hmm. people on your podcast, but no one really knows some of this, like the people that are listening to it have questions about maybe yeah. some of the things that made you who you were. So he came on, he sabotaged my podcast and interviewed me and people loved it because it was like, it was really awkward for me to be like someone else controlling. And I, I would start something. He'd be like, Hey, well, Jay, Jay, whose podcast is this? It's not yours today. So just sit down and listen. <laughs> and yeah. It was really fun to do, do it that way. So I love being on, I can't wait to be on your podcast. Uh, Corinne moments. Um, is there anything else you want to send them to your Instagram is Corinne dot moments, uh, at Corinne dot moments. Yeah. Anywhere else you want to send people. That's it right now. There's the podcast, there's Instagram and I'm putting out, I'm getting together a fresh new website to kind of accompany cool. the, the podcast as well. And this, um, kind of this brand that I'm working on building. Cause I really am so fascinated about the theme of finding purpose after purpose. I think that so many of us in so many different aspects of our life get to go through that. Um, whether you're a career woman who just started a family and now isn't identifying fully as herself anymore because you've lost or you've put that career aside or you've changed from being an athlete to being a something else. And like, I think that we, you know, we change our skins so many times in our life. Uh, so it's, it's just a fascinating topic. Yeah. And, and you know what, you've got great guests and you're, you've got great topics on your podcast. So um, I, I highly recommend everybody check that out. It's a lot of, it's a lot of self self love and a lot of, you know, um, self discovery uh, stuff. So if, if this episode has kind of touched you in any way, or you felt some kind of uh, connection to it, then there's a ton of uh, episodes on current moments. And I highly recommend you guys check it out. So um, we always finish these podcasts with, um, a dream big over deliver and be undeniable. Those are the three kind of pillars that we live by. Um, and I just want you to pick one. So, uh, dream big is something that you're, you're working towards. Um, and it, and it should be something that's so grand and so big that you kind of get the hair on your arm, uh, kind of <laughs> stands up when you think about it. Right. Or, um, it's a story of being undeniable where, you know, you might want to share with the, with the glisteners, uh, maybe a little story or, or something, a lesson that you've learned about when you hit an obstacle and you decided not to be denied and you were undeniable in that. And then lastly, um, um, uh, over deliver, which is when you have something in your life that you've accomplished uh, and you took that moment and said, no, I know I, that's what I was asked to do, but I will over delivered on it. And, and a lesson that came from that. Is there anything that of those three topics that comes to mind for you that you can share a lesson for our listeners as you as we sign off? You know what? For me, a, a big one has been the over delivery, and in some ways it's been, and sometimes it's been positive in my life, and other times it's been not so positive. Um, as you can probably tell, I'm a really outgoing boisterous person with a relatively large personality. And when we were just doing the creation of the show on tour, I, we were you know, creating all the choreographies and just rehearsing all day long. And I was up there at the front, like eager beaver, just super like, I know, I know, I know it. I know it. I know. Pick me, pick me, pick me, pick me. And eventually I got called out like Corinne, calm the F down. You need to stop trying to like lead the show like stop it it's too much you're you are too much yeah. and I was like but I'm the only one that knows all these choreographies and all I had all this like narrative inside my head and I'm like I'm I'm gonna be the leader and they're gonna see that I should be dance captain and they're gonna pick me um like both literally and not so literally and 
they, they told me to calm down and like basically put myself back into the box that I was meant to be contained in. And I spent a lot of years containing myself. And eventually I did get to be dance captain, just not at the time that I thought like in my timeline, I had set it up, but they, my time came and I got that position anyways. And I, I continued to show up and I continued to over deliver. I just held myself back a little bit so that I wasn't too much. But you, so that, you under you over delivered by kind of under under delivering you, yeah. what you thought was over delivering was way over the top. Yeah. Um, so I don't like you with your story of when you were a trainer and you'd come in and you. Yeah, it was yeah. too much, too much, too, too much. much. <laughs> too so, much. Yeah. So and for me, that's been a big theme as as a woman who really like I believe that we shouldn't contain ourselves and we really should like show up as we are unapologetically, but at the same time, we do have to be cognizant of the others around us and how we're making them kind of be perceived as well. Not necessarily how we're making them feel because their feelings are not my concern, but um, yeah, that's totally a topic for another day. But I, I, I do believe that we, we should over deliver and but we also have to really use our intuition to know like the timing things don't always come to fruition in the timing that we expect them to, but just to keep plugging along. Yeah. It's almost like uh, you're, you're seasoning, like you can over season something like seasoning is good uh, when the balance is right, but you put too much on and all of a sudden it ruins the meal. Um, yeah. So you, you can over deliver on creation um, but don't over season it. Um, maybe that's just a bad analogy, but maybe, maybe it works. No, that's good. That's really good. That's exactly what it is. There was just way too much garlic, <laughs> too much garlic, too much garlic, too much salt. I'll tell you what, uh, we'll continue this conversation on current moments, uh, in a future podcast, but, uh, for now dream big over deliver be undeniable and cheers everybody. Mm-hmm.